and whose chip makes some sense outside the Arduino framework. I want you to understand how to look up this type of information. And we may be using the Arduino as something pe people are familiar with, but we're going to be looking at it as though we were developing software for any other development board. And let's start with the hardware. You can find lots of draw diagrams like this. They're called exploded pin diagrams, and they describe the development board from the end user's perspective. Uh, they show which pins can be used for what purposes. And this is how a user of the Arduino sees the board. But let's look from another perspective, um, as if we were going to build the board. I am getting notes that things are going wrong. Are things cleared up my class part team? I will, we are, okay, things are good. Um, well, I already had a joke prepped, so I'm just gonna go ahead with it. Um, what's the difference between a joke and a rhetorical question? Given what I know about the Arduino, I'd start a hardware block diagram with something like this. This is the most interesting part of the microcontroller. It's the, it's the, I'm sorry, this is the most interesting part of the Arduino. It's the microcontroller. It's the end feature of the board as the Arduino as a development board. I was a little hesitant whether the IO pins belong on a hardware diagram um, or they're just part of the microcontroller. They come directly from the microcontroller, but they're kind of separate on the board so I included them because it is an important feature of the Arduino development board. I'm gonna add another block, the USB to UART, also called USB to serial. This translates something your computer speaks to something the microcontroller understands. It's used for programming the board. Uh, it's the same pathway used for debugging the UNO and for printing out data as the code runs. On most block diagrams, this piece would be tiny, a small box. It's a minor feature. It's sometimes part of a cable, but we're building up to a schematic here. So I'm keeping it about as large as the space it takes on the Arduino schematic. And then there's the power system. The Arduino board is a little odd because you can plug it into USB or you can plug it into five volts, a DC wall ward. If you think about the electronic systems around you, a phone, a mouse, a webcam, usually it's one or the other. But on this board, you can plug in both and not blow anything up. Its power supply is more complicated because of that flexibility. Fitting my hardware block diagram over the schematic, I get this. And this process can go either way. An idea goes to a block diagram, which then goes to a schematic, or a board a product has a board and you figure out the schematic and by puzzling over the schematic, you get a block diagram to better understand the system. There are a couple pieces here that are a bit odd that you might not normally notice if you're using an Arduino board. The circled header on the right of the screen is for programming the Arduino bootloader, something that happens in the factory when the board is assembled. You could use the programming port instead of the USB to your section of the board but you need a cable or a small widget to make it work. Uh, the one I have is called an AVR dude. If you were building a product, you'd probably want to look into programming with that interface as a way to replace the whole USB to serial subsystem, which is a whole microcontroller and programmed with the left circled header. And I've had the schematics in the background, but I want to show you what they actually look like up close. This is the power sec section we saw before. This is the microcontroller that is used for programming, the Atmega328 that we think of as the Arduino processor. They can feel like looking at ancient Egyptian, full of mysterious hieroglyphics. The secret is to see the overview before you get lost in the details. You'll need those details on your schematic. And I have spent plenty of time tracing these lines, trying to figure out if it is hardware or software that has them wrong. 
But before we get lost in the details, find the bigger pieces on the schematic. This is the Atmega 16U2. Um, and it's the USB to serial processor. And this is the Atmega 23, 8, 328, Atmega 328, the one we think of as the UNO processor. Okay, I'm going to break for questions and see what path we take next. All right, I am not getting any questions. And I warn you that you should come up with questions next time or there might be a quiz. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about schematics to boards and puzzling out another schematic. And yes, I do know there's a delay. So uh, we will this, you know, you have a little time, but you still have to type fast. And usually when we think about schematics, um, the next thing to think about is the board, getting to a board, like schematics somehow generate a board. It isn't quite like that. There are a few steps to get from a schematic to an assembled PCB. And this is a simplified list of the steps. We've talked about block diagrams and schematic. The bill of materials is a list of the parts on the board, figuring out what parts are available and generally how much they cost. Someone needs to buy all of these parts. The schematic itself goes from being a symbolic representation of how components are connected together to an actual drawing of how everything is light laid out. This gets turned into a Gerber file, a used by board manufacturers to create multiple layers of conductive and non-conductive material, according to the drawings made in layout. The bare board gets assembled with all the parts listed and purchased from the bill of materials. And then usually there's some testing or to make sure that nothing has gone wrong. And then finally, we get to the good stuff. I'm more of a software engineer than a hardware engineer. If you wanna know more about the manufacturing steps, uh, making the board and assembling them, check out the inside the PCB soldering factor, factory from Strange Parts on YouTube. Here, let me put that in the chat and we'll make sure it ends up in a link. Now, if we think back to our hardware block diagram of the microcontroller, the IO, the USB to serial and power supply, these are the same pieces that are on the board, just like you'd expect. I see that we do in fact have a question, so let's go ahead and do that. Glasper uh, is telling me that Ben Henke has a question. Why not FTDI or other USB serial chip? Uh, for the Arduino interface, we could in fact use an FTDI cable or other serial chip to program the Arduino. But when the Arduino first came out, and this is one of the very early boards, those didn't really exist. I mean, the FTDI chip did, and Atmel said, well, we'll just use this one because it's cheaper if we use all our own parts. Um, as they partnered with Arduino to make this board. Uh, so the microcontroller, the 16, at Mega 16 microcontroller, that's really all it does. There are a few things to make it easier to recover the at Mega 328, the main processor, but it's a pretty dumb little processor that doesn't have much more than uh, than any FTDI chip. Uh, and Ben actually got a better answer that you can program uh, the USB device ID and description string so that your Arduinos can be named different things. 
Are there any other questions at this time? Okay, let's go on. Um, and I did, in fact, promise you a quiz. Uh, so I've offered to let you ask questions, so this can be more interactive. Uh, and this does go both ways, and I'm hoping this one's easy. Faced with an unknown schematic, what should you do first if you want to understand the system? And I'm not going to read those aloud to you. I, I'm hoping you can read them. Um, so I'm going to skip to the to the hint, which is exploring the larger chips and components they connect to is a really good way to start reading a schematic. Uh, but there's another quiz. This one's harder because it's going to ask you to go off to a different uh, different thing entirely, to a different schematic. Here, I'll put this over in the comments. And you can link it. Oops, that's a terrible link. I'm so sorry. Um, but you can see it here on my screen. This is a STM32 F0 uh, disco board which is made by ST Microsystems. And we're going to look at the schematic a little bit. OK, if the link was cut off or otherwise unusable, you should be able to just search for this board. I am going to let somebody else take care of that because searching for the STM32 F2 F072B disco schematic will get you here. Okay. So live thing is not too hard. Uh, okay, so this this page is totally boring. And the quiz question was page one has the name of the board. Which of these might describe page two? So this is page two. Um, one of the answers is that it is a block diagram of the system, a shorthand, shorthand way of knowing what's in the schematic. And maybe, but maybe not, because it doesn't look like much. Uh, second answer was it's the primary schematic. Other pages are detailed schematics and layout. Well, if we flip through these other pages, yeah, there's more detail here. And in fact, we get some layout information. So never heard of a primary schematic. C was it shows the connections between pages. Uh, see the title section of the info block. Oh, the info block. Let's take a look at that. Over here you go. So if we take a title, we have the STM32. Here we have the MEMS USB, the sensor PB. OK. What it, oh, we were supposed to be looking at page two. So oh. OK, so it sounds like the title section of the info block is important. Uh, let's see, my other options are, it shows the general layout of the board. No, we know that, that isn't true. We've already paged through and seen the general layout and where things are placed. So that's not page two. And the last option was that this serves no purpose. It's automatically generated by a schematic capture software. That's not true. We like double E's who include these. They're very helpful. So the answer was, in fact, C. It shows the connections between pages so that when you're looking at one page, you only have to go to a single other page to figure out what, are, what else you need to look at. So we've seen the schematic and with its USB and power sections, but I'm really here for the microcontroller. And, you know, 
The microcontroller is an important part of this. Classpert, you might, might want to make me bigger instead of my screen if you can do that, but otherwise just check out the little camera. You should treat your boards like this. Um, chips are sensitive to ESD and ele static electricity will zap their little brains. So doing this to a chip is just wrong. I mean, it's just wrong, but it's fun. So here it is. This is the good part of the board. I could put this chip on a breadboard. And if I had the right USB to serial cable, I could program it. Or I could use my AVR dude. And I don't need the rest of the Arduino board. This is the interesting part. We know it programs over serial, and there are plenty of off-the-shelf serial to USB cables. But what could we program this little guy to do? First, we need to remember its part number from the schematic we had earlier, at mega 328. Or we need to be able to read it off the chip itself. I don't think my camera is going to cooperate with that. OK, back to my screen, please. If I search for at mega 328, I end up with some links. Um, it's a pretty popular chip. DigiKey is usually a good place to look, but I happen to know that Microchip makes this part. So I'm going to go to their website. And if I click on the data sheet, we get a look at what the manufacturer thinks is important about this chip. So this first page, it's nonsense. I mean, if you have been doing this for a while and you're in the process of comparing several different chips, this is the information you likely need. It's all compact, it's two pages, it's super handy. But for folks getting started with the processor, this is nonsense. You don't need it, don't let it scare you off. I opened the table of contents over here on the left. And after I get through the pages of contents, it's going to take me to pin configuration. The S, the 28 SP dip matches what I have here on my microcontroller. So we've gotten that far. We can look at the pin descriptions to see if there's something interesting. Well, I'm going too fast for that because I want to get to the overview. This is interesting. This, use, this image is useful. It gives you a whole view of the system to refer back to. But we're on page 16 of 600. You don't have to read them all. Each, each thing has a separate section. You only need what's useful right now. But this comparison between processors table we can see some options with cheaper processors. And if we page down here some more, we get to the AVR core. The AVR core is what's inside an AVR CPU. And at Mega 328 is an AVR CPU. That's a lot of details. But if you want a condensed lesson in microcontroller design, this is pretty interesting. For using the chip, the compiler will hide most of all most of this behind a programming language. So even as I'm saying, look deeper in the Arduino board, now I'm going to say, OK, this is deep enough. I don't want to look at the microcontroller today. Might be fun to look at another time, but not today. We're going to leave the AVR core itself and skip to the next chapter, uh, memories. Flash is where your code goes. It sticks between reboots and requires special fiddling to change. Other kinds of memory here, SRAM. That is memory that changes easily. It's where your variables are. And when you power off the system, those don't stick around. EEPROM is kind of like Flash in that it's non-volatile. It, it sticks around, it lasts through power cycles, but like RAM in that it isn't too hard to modify. So let's go on to the next section. There's 
actually a lot here and you don't need me reading it to you. I'll pop this link, which I'm hoping will work into the comments. And you can look on your own while I show you what I would be doing with a class. I'm not going to make you do this part, but if you were in my class, I'd ask you to spend a few minutes looking through the data sheet and then give you a quiz. The quiz would be open book or open data sheet as the case may be, because sometimes you need to look over the whole data sheet to get a broad understanding of the chip. And sometimes you need to look up one little piece. Uh, search or find is a really, really good uh, tool for data sheets when you need to answer a question. For now though, you can do a reading, do a bit of reading on your own and see if you can answer these questions. What is this chip? What can it do? What can you do with it? And we have a question about what is the need for both flash and EEPROM? That's a good question because it isn't exactly obvious. They're both non-volatile. They both don't change through power cycles. So why have both? Well, Flash, you have to program in, or you have to erase it in pages, which are pretty big, like 4K. And if you wanted to be able to uh, store how many times you were booted, how many times you woke up, uh, you could put that in EEPROM. But if you put it in Flash, you'd have to erase a whole page each time you wanted to change anything. So Flash is big and you change it big, big things at a time. EEPROM, you can change little things at a time, but it takes more power to use and it tends not to last forever. And it often takes longer than programming big flash pages. So you wanna use EEPROMs for variables you want to stick around and you want to use Flash for code. Um, I think that answers that. I could go on, but I think we have, we also had a question about which IDEs I prefer. That's a personal preference. Um, I, I kind of love the VS code that's out. It's so versatile. Um, and I can talk about uh, Kyle's MDK or IAR or PSAC Creator, and I don't, I, yes, IAR, I don't want to say anything bad about any of those, but I will say that I really like VS Code. Uh, yes, IAR. I feel like you may be punking me to see if I'm going to say mean things about people. And the truth is all of those compilers have a good place in your ecosystem. They make things easier to get started. Um, you pay for them because they already have code and because then you have somebody to yell at. So, and somebody to ask for help from. When you're setting up a GCC tool chain, you don't necessarily have that. Uh, okay, back to the EEPROM question. Yes, EEPROM would be great for storing positions of knobs because those change. And uh, Flash would be better for storing your code. Even EEPROM would be better for storing user presets because those might change. They might want to change those. Um, but Flash is often cheaper to put into a processor. So you'll find many processors don't have an EEPROM, have to have one externally, or have to use the Flash as a... EEPROM storage system, which gets really complicated because you don't want to erase that too many times. You end up writing the variable many times and you end up using the last one. And it's called a KV store, which is way beyond the, the topic here. So I'm, I, I will say KV store and let you Google that because they're pretty cool. Um, let's see, where was I? I was giving you a quiz and there'll be more questions in a minute. Um, Let's go back to the at mega page because there's some cool stuff here that you may not know about if you mostly treat the Arduino as a board that you just use. Um, the thing with the data sheet is that the vendor wants you to use this part. They want to tell you everything they can. 
Most chips and vendors are like that. The at mega data sheet has all the register definitions and some example code. Another vendor might put that in the reference manual or user manual or programming reference manual, all the different names you can imagine. So pages and pages of documents here. There's one about understanding ADC parameters. It's an introduction to how ADCs work and it's specific to their chip, but there's a lot of words here that might be interesting. Um, this is far more detailed than a Wikipedia page can go. Though that's a useful point for getting a start. And I talk more about ADCs in the class, uh, but right now we're focused on finding documents that can help us build a system. So I leave that tab later open for later reading and head back to the documents. I mentioned reference manuals. Um, and there is, of course, a reference manual here, but this is for the chip core. It goes through the whole AVR core, the instruction set, in case you want to read or write assembly. Like I said, it's a great way to learn about microcontrollers, but I want to use those as black boxes. I want to get deeper than the board, but not so far that I'm into the microcontroller. Another type of document is the errata. Now, this isn't something they tell you until long after you've needed it. It's really important. This is where the vendor tells us about bugs in their chip. Ha. Huh. Uh, I've had chips where it turned out the I squared C communication port didn't work under certain circumstances. They didn't change the manual because they were fixing it in later revisions in the processor. But I didn't check the errata for a long time and was very unhappy to learn the bug wasn't in my code, but actually in the chip. I always check for errata for your processors and your peripherals, except it's often hard to figure out what version you have. You have to look at the chip to see the markings on the silicon. And I admit I don't check the errata as often as I should. I blindly trust the chip vendors far too often. For my little microcontroller here on my Arduino, the markings, they're almost invisible to my eye, but with a bright light, the camera picks it up. And I couldn't decode these. They don't conform to the, mark to the documentation from Microchip or Atmel, the company that used to make Atmega 328 that was bought by Microchip. And not knowing for certain I'm going to have to assume that the errata applies to my chip until proven otherwise. I'm going to spend just a little more time on this documentation table and show you the application notes. There are 13 pages of application notes. This goes back to vendors writing documentation so you use their chip. They want to make it easy for you. So when something's confusing or commonly done with the processor, they'll write an application note. That's so they don't have to answer the same questions over and over. It's often the best way to learn about the things you can do with your processor. So it's worth taking a look at the application notes available to you. OK, now I'm going to go to questions, because I see a lot of them. They're kind of flying past. Um, what are my thoughts on risk five, risk fee? It's getting there. It's going to be really cool when I get to use it, but I haven't gotten to use it yet. I spend most of my time being an embedded software engineer, shipping products, shipping devices or scientific equipment. I haven't gotten to use a risk five yet because it hasn't been ready for any of my products. ARM Cortex M is usually what I'm using. They are cheap, they're uh, power, extremely power efficient, and they're ubiquitous. I understand the tools for them. And even as I use tools that build partial FPGA sections for things like the Cypress PSOC, 
I don't really have to worry about that too much. So when there's a risk five dev board, it doesn't require me to use FPGA and has a nice compiler and is in line for something I can use for a product, I'll consider it, but it's not my first choice. Uh, it's really interesting. I've loved watching it because it's a processor that they're, it's an open source processor. I should have defined that first. RISC-V is an open source processor. That means that when I talk about the AVR core, the processor part, the, the really interesting part is totally open and you can modify it. If you want your processor to do multiplication much faster, you can add that. If you want to have 97 serial ports, have that. The processor is open source. You put that all uh, together and then you build a chip. Uh, fabulous semiconductor is a thing. Uh, let's see, there is Uh, okay, Clasper, I don't understand what you're saying, so I'm going to go on. Uh, with the chip shortage, uh, am I able to check for chips <laughs> for Errata first, or do you just use what's available <laughs> and work around the Errata? I often have to work around the Errata. It, right now, it's an availability problem. Um, it's, it's a... Uh, you use whatever you can get. But even before that, I've had to work around Arata because I often work on chips that are new to the market. And that's fun. Uh, but you, when you get Rev-A silicon, you expect some chips. And the Arata may get fixed before you go to production, but it may not be fixed before you go to your prototype stage, in which case you have to deal with it. And once it's in the code, it stays there forever. Which languages do you use and which do you prefer? I use C primarily and I prefer C++. Um, there are other good languages out there. Uh, CircuitPython is a great way to learn to change up your Arduino game. If you're playing mostly with Arduinos, uh, CircuitPython is really cool from Adafruit. Lots of boards. Uh, the, and it's a pathway to get to MicroPython, which is a more efficient version. There's Rust, which I have only failed to use. I've never successfully used, so I have some bias against that. Um, Ada is used in some types of platforms, um, more often seen in uh, systems requiring very robust error handling. Um, Ada is a provable language and lets you prove that you're doing things right, which still doesn't count for hardware and cosmic rays. Um, but mostly, almost entirely, I use C. And I look at assembly. Um, I don't program much in assembly. If I'm programming in assembly, I am doing something wrong or I'm doing something that needs to be super efficient, like a, a motor controller system. Okay. Uh, all right, then, oh, Ben has a great suggestion about being able to see the markings on the chip. You take a silver Sharpie, wipe off, put it on the chip, wipe it off, and then it leaves the readable chip markings after you wipe off the silver Sharpie. I've never done that. I'm gonna have to try it. Okay, questions. Um, hmm. How do you account for things like cosmic rays while debugging? Ah. Uh, watchdog timers, make sure that if my system goes out to lunch, there is a recovery method. If I'm working on uh, 
fail your critical critical systems, then it needs to fail safely. So whatever happens shouldn't hurt people. So those are the types of things you put in as a design thing to account for random errors, cosmic rays. If I'm actually thinking about putting something in space, you can protect against cosmic rays. But I use cosmic rays as a way of saying random hardware bug I haven't figured out yet. And if you're getting lots of cosmic rays, then you should be figuring out the random hardware bug pretty soon. I can talk more about that if you want to ask more, um, but I will instead go on to what you might use instead of an Arduino. There's a whole list of things you might use instead of an Arduino, and there are steps to go from an Arduino to something like the STM F0 that I have listed here. And I like Arduinos, but as I said in the beginning, I don't think they should be used for commercial products. And here's one of the big reasons why. The Arduino board lists for about $20 US. And the processor is about 263 the last time I checked. You saw from the data sheet, the processor, it's an 8-bit processor with a bunch of features. However, that board and that processor are very expensive for what they can do you can get a much cheaper board, a more powerful processor. And when you choose Arduino, you get a lot of the code for free. But with vendor HALs and open source libraries, you get some code for free. It's harder to understand, but the vendor HALs and open source libraries probably have better licensing for their software. Free is in beer as well as in freedom. And with processors like this, 32-bit processors, you can get better debugging. Being able to step through your code and watch variables. With the app Mega, it will always be printf. There's something here to understand about when you grow out of the Arduino. It takes time and money to move from one platform to the next. Running out of Arduino capabilities and needing to move when you're in the middle of trying to get a product out is going to be super painful. So when you're looking at product development, you need to consider from the start, this will be harder to learn, but I'll have more headspace if I need it. And I'm not trying to discourage you from using Arduinos in your personal projects. They are fun and easy, but for a professional, they leave some things to be desired. Um, let's see, do I have, am I getting? Do you have to pay a license fee to Arduino if you ship a product with their if you ship a product with their product and software? That's a really good question that actually just takes me to the next slide. So I'm going to go there. Software, software. We've looked at the board schematic. We've looked at the data sheet. The next big piece is software. And as I said in the beginning, when I say Arduino, it can mean so many things. It can mean the hardware. Um, it can mean the Arduino development tools. It can mean the Arduino hardware abstraction layer and the library and driver ecosystem. It can mean Arduino is the language, which is also known as processing, or C++ if you want to be realistic about it. And there's even Arduino the maker movement. One of the standard arguments in favor of the Arduino ecosystem is that it's easier for an inexperienced developer. There's so many drop drivers and libraries and example code. You can get things running so quickly. And the API to peripherals is something we need to do better in professional development. It's so much nicer there. The development IDE, uh, the, the development environment, it's simple and it's great for beginners, for beginners, for people who are distracted by basic syntax checking while you type autocomplete, built-in documentation, or essential debugging tools. And yeah, you can change uh, some settings to, and use a different editor, but then we've taken away a large piece of the Arduino-ness of the development environment. And so there are some impediments to using the Arduino ecosystem. And that leads back to the question. You don't have to pay a license to ship an Arduino product with all of their product and software. 
assuming you're just using the Arduino, there are some other libraries you may be using. You'll have to check those separately. But you do have to make all of your object files public. The Arduino ecosystem is not free for commercial use unless you post your object files so somebody else can recreate your binary image. Now, good luck finding those object files hidden somewhere on your drive by the Arduino IDE. And this is only for the main Arduino libraries. Most people also use libraries from other sources. And you have to get splunk through the licenses to figure out which code you can use in a commercial situation. And this is one of those things where I say, when you are making, you don't have to worry about the licenses associated with the code you write. You're just doing it for yourself. Nobody is going to cause a fuss with that. But if you're shipping products and making money, you need to understand the licenses associated so that you don't bankrupt your company. And that's true for any open source software. Um, I've already mentioned the debugger would be helpful for development. And a streamlined IDE hides all the details that I usually want to see. Sure, it hides the ugly pieces, but it hides the useful pieces too. And with the Arduino IDE, the ugly parts are still there. You just can't control them any longer. And Arduino's processing language, it's a tiny covering over C++. And C++ crosses, classes. C++ classes are a great way to get to unit testing and better software practices. But Arduino IDE actively discourages that by the, making their file layout and directory dependence be super weird. Um, the example and driver libraries are not efficiently written. They're trying to support every Arduino-ish platform. No respect for limited resources. And sure, processors are getting ever more powerful. So there's processing time and code space and power available um, usually, but that's all reflected in the bomb cost and in the user cost. So you have to think about what you really want from all of this. And if it's a system you can ship, I'm not sure this is the right one. And I'm pretty much out of time. So I'm just going to have a couple more slides. And then if we want to hang out for questions afterwards, we can. Um, and back to the back to the board, back to the board, which now doesn't have a processor. Um, I think of the Arduino as a board that is great for mocking things up quickly. Some, a quick way to learn about project constraints and requirements. It's great for slapping together that prototype. It's great for checking out a peripheral to see if it does what you want. But sometimes people bring me their Arduino systems and they say all the hard pieces are done. They just want to productize it and make a lot of money. The software is working. Oh, all they need is a simple board spin. So it fits in the 3D printed case. Maybe a couple code modifications, like remote firmware update, but it's done. It's all the software's done. They don't want to hear that they've barely scratched the surface of developing a product. But it's true. I'm not suggesting you look at data sheets and reference manuals and schematics for fun. We need those things to make products that do all the things we need them to do. We need to understand how to go from an Arduino I squared C library to the processor's registers, because there will be a peripheral that doesn't quite work. And debugging without understanding will take forever. We need to understand what it means when the compiler says we're out of space, and then we'll need to fix it. We need to have battery powered devices. So we read the application notes on efficient coding and really look into those sleep modes. There's so much jargon, and it doesn't always make sense when you get started. That's one of the barriers for makers. But that's OK. A lot of it is learned by looking at the schematics and reading the documents. It won't be too long before the words make sense. And then there'll be whole worlds you can build with that understanding. In the meantime, you ask questions. And I do have to uh, put in a little pitch for the class I'm teaching. It's been really fun. Some of the folks in the comments have attended the class. and. I think they liked it. They turned in some pretty good projects. 
Uh, I teach a course at Classpert um, about making embedded systems that goes along with my book, Making Embedded Systems. We read the book in the course and I've recorded video lectures with quizzes for students to consume offline. And they work on a final project that we hope they can take to a job interview. We have a great community for each cohort on Discord and mentors who help out. And then we do this live class on Saturdays where students ask questions, sometimes submitting them ahead of time, sometimes putting them in chat. It's kind of like today, but about all kinds of different projects, all kinds of different topics. Um, if you want to know more, uh, the next co cohort is open for enrollment. They will be called the Orange Stars. We just finished the Red Jellies. Uh, we expect it to fill up, so don't wait. And the link is in the description. All right, um, I'm going to take a, a look for a couple of questions, but I really am pretty much out of time, aren't I? Wow, OK. Um, ESP32 and ESP8266. I used the ESP32 um, not long after it came out. There's always that danger of being an early adopter because you just you just look around and say, this, this is awful. What, what are you doing? At the time, I had been working with Broadcom chips um, and their wicked development system, which was aptly named so wicked, as in so awful. Um, I haven't really gotten to use the 80, ESP8266 because I just haven't. Um, I know that the ESP32 grew into something that was much better. I don't really know what it is. Um, if you want to know more, I would actually ask Ben, who's in the chat, because he knows a heck of a lot about those processors. And I don't. I'm more in the Cortex land. I think we should all get back to our Saturdays, um, whether it's morning or evening for you. I really appreciate that you took the time to hang out with me. And if you want to find me, um, I'm on Twitter. At, uh, well, I should have a slide that says all this stuff, shouldn't I? Um, let's see. I'm at Logical Elegance on Twitter. That is the name of my company that does consulting. And uh, and I have a podcast where we talk about random things and people. Um, it's embedded.fm. Just type that into Google and you'll find us. That has a contact page. And we talk about a lot of interesting stuff. Um, it's different from the class because we talk about people in engineering, where the class is more about here's how you do it. Here's how you go from being a beginner, junior engineer who knows how to program to being somebody who can design systems. All right, I'm going to push the end broadcast um, button and say thank you very, very much because I'm going to start blushing for some of these thank yous that you're giving me. <laughs>